J.D. Gunnell is the horticulture agent for Utah State University Extension in Salt Lake County. He's been employed with USU Extension for seven and a half years. His background and research has been in growing and caring for woody plants. He's currently developing a demonstrational tree arboretum at the Utah State University Botanical Center in Kaysville, which will focus on water use of different tree species. And I'll let him get started and present his research to you. Go ahead, J.D. Well, uh, as Rose said, my name is J.D. Gunnell. I'm the horticulture agent uh, for Salt Lake County. I've been here for two years. Uh, prior to my time here, I was in Davis County as the horticulture agent, with part of my si assignment being in developing uh, demonstration areas at the USUBC, or the Botanical Center in Kaysville. Um, before my time with Extension, I actually was a tree production manager for J&J &J Nursery in Layton, where I managed uh, nearly 100 acres of in-ground tree production and 10,000 uh, pot-and-pot trees in, in their production as well. So I've, I've got some history in growing and killing trees. Uh, in my Extension assignment, one of the things that I've noticed uh, I've noticed actually two things. Um, first, that extension's probably the best kept secret out there. Nobody really knows who we are or what we do. We're kind of like Santa Claus in that respect. But also that we are the local problem solvers. The people that do know who we are come to us on a regular basis to help them figure out what kind of things are going wrong in their landscapes. So I've had to become proficient, uh, not as much as I would like to be, but in entomology and pathology, soil science, and and that all-encompassing uh, plant world and what things are and what grows well. Um, in, re in, in extension, uh, our number one goal is to give sound research-based information to the public in a non-biased fashion, and it becomes uh, kind of tricky in how that happens. I was talking to Meredith before we got started and sometimes it's difficult in a forum like this where there's not a lot of interaction to educate or to talk about uh, things intelligently. So I would welcome any comments or, or questions that you guys have along the way, um, especially when we start talking about species. If you have personal interaction or personal experience with some of the plants we're going to be talking about. I'm only one person, and so I would I would welcome any input. Uh, that being said, when when we uh, attempt to talk about trees and shrubs and, and proper selection, I think it's interesting to note that it's it's not really rocket science in a lot of our jobs in having things grow. Mother Nature does it naturally. I was able to go to Great Basin National Park this last year with some colleagues and an, another assignment with my job and we we saw these bristlecone pines that were thousands of years old and in the urban forestry world it's interesting to note that most trees only live seven to ten years before they die. Um, I would say uh, diagnosing problems is probably one of the more relevant things that I do as an agent with the university and helping people discern what has happened to their trees. So I'm just going to tell you a couple stories to get started on the importance of site selection and species selection and then we'll get right into the, the plant introduction or the tree trial. Uh, research that has been going on for the last five, six years at the gardens. Um, the first one, this is a, <clears throat> a picture of a sycamore that's planted in the wrong spot. It's a four-foot park strip. This uh, happened two years ago where this, this city that I won't name uh, had an issue with the trees buckling the sidewalk and they didn't want the liability of someone walking through and, and tripping and suing the city for, for tripping on the sidewalk. So they hired a company to come in and pour a new concrete. In, in doing that, the company 
uh, came through with chainsaws and cut half the root system off these sycamores and poured the new sidewalk and went on their way. Um, and if you remember last year, just a, a little over a year ago in December of 2012, we had in Davis County microbursts winds that exceeded 100 miles an hour. And so we went down, uh, Jerry Goodspeed and myself, because we knew uh, after this pruning of the roots had taken place that the trees were compromised. So we went down that next morning and sure enough the trees had gone over. And so the liability went from somebody tripping on the sidewalk to an actual tree failing. And so again in, in extension we try to promote sound information and trees and park strips are very difficult situations. Uh, this is a fact sheet that we put out with Mike Coons and Sean Olson on small trees for small spaces. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know how many of you are aware of some of the statistics on education and learning models, but if you were to download this and, and read it, you'd probably retain about 20% of what you hear and read. Whereas if you hear and see something, uh, you can retain 50% of what you see and hear. Uh, and so this next um, picture, I like I like showing when I'm doing trainings on species selection because it's a it's a very vivid um, example of a Colorado blue spruce, the straight species that can get 60 to 80 feet tall, planted right next to a, a structure, and and kind of the dangers that involve that. It's hard to see, but let's see if I can do some technical. Oh, right there. So this is. Uh, I like to call natural selection at work. I know that's not probably, I, I, I don't mean to make light of it, but this is the chimney and it's right under the canopy of that tree. And so you can imagine that there's a huge possibility for fire. Um, and so <clears throat> with, along with the learning models and, and knowing how much people can retain, if people can do something one time, they'll actually retain 90% of that knowledge. And that's where the Arboretum and this tree demonstration area came into to focus for me as an agent is if I could get people to come on an Arbor Day and plant a tree and see how to do it correctly or to walk through and experience the trees, the different species that grow well along the Wasatch Front, then they could take that home with them and, and experience that really well. Um, we saw Colorado blue spruce um, before and see how big they get, but some cultivars that work really well in a landscape situation. Um, this one on the left is Fat Albert cultivar. This taller one is the columnar uh, variety. This one here is Montgomery and then this small one in the foreground that you can barely see is Globosa. So you can see that how powerful of an education facility this has become in talking about plant selection. Um, I know that the local nurseries in Davis County have been very supportive in giving plant material. I'll tell you a couple stories uh, in the future, but they they also send their clientele here so they could see these these plants growing in in a, in a in a natural, semi-natural habitat anyway. Um, one thing I think we can keep in mind as urban foresters and educators and and talking to clients even is sometimes Mother Nature gives us the best education that uh, that we can get. This last windstorm a year ago really gave us some great opportunities to talk to people about tree selection and varieties and species to avoid. Uh, Colorado blue spruce was one of the ones that was most hit in, in the windstorm. Uh, there was a Davis County golf course that lost over 400 trees on their property, 380 of which uh, and even more were straight Colorado spruce. And so it becomes a really great teaching um, component when we talk. But 
uh, a little bit of history on demonstration. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the the Arboretum in Kaysville, but what people sometimes don't understand or don't realize is that USU has had a botanical garden since the 1950s. Uh, some of you may have remembered or been to the old gardens in Farmington. They comprise of seven acres of demonstration gardens and extension research. This is applied research that extension agents um, from around the state could come in and participate in. But then in the late 90s, uh, UDOT came through and uh, with some construction, we ended up losing the gardens. And Utah State University purchased 94 acres in Kaysville, where we moved a lot of the specimen trees and shrubs at that time. And so I've got some pictures here coming up. This is an aerial view of the gardens. Um, it was a great spot for the public to come and, and look at the different varieties and, and species that performed well. I'm a huge proponent in uh, seeing is believing. And so when we can offer the public s something to those regards, it, it really helps in, in our educational aspect. Here's another view, and many of these trees were moved. Um, there's the garden director at the time was Bill Varga, and he had some heads up, obviously, from the Department of Transportation about the construction coming through. So for two seasons, he was able to come through and root prune about a third of the root ball on some of these larger specimen plants. And then they hired a company out of Colorado to come and spade dig and move a lot of these trees and shrubs to the Kaysville site. So if any of you have never been to the gardens, uh, here's an aerial view to give you a little bit of direction. This is I-15 um, southbound. These are the ponds in Kaysville. Uh, down off the screen to the left, you would have the granaries in Kaysville, so the 200 uh, north exit. This is the frontage road up here. And so we're right on the frontage road. Uh, it comprises of nearly 100 acres. And as you can imagine, any of you that have developed or done landscaping in the past, it's quite an undertaking. Uh, where the circus yellow circle is up at the top, that's where the, a lot of the trees were planted when they were transplanted on site. And uh, I've got another view here. Um, <clears throat> so you can see that we make pretty good neighbors. We have open open space here. And when I first started uh, and took the project on in extension, it was 2007, and a lot of these trees were starting to decline. When they were moved, there was a temporary irrigation system set up through a drip system, and the trees were watered for a couple of years. And then uh, just due to budget cuts and, and constraints on time and people, the trees actually went without water for two seasons. And so some of them declined. Uh, we came through and cleaned them up. Uh, I actually didn't have any idea the trees were here until I took a walk one day and saw through the four foot weeds that there was actually plant material in here. So with the help of a local landscaper, we came through and cleaned all the debris out, uh, controlled a lot of the weeds. And one uh, thing I started to notice on the trees that were starting to decline, we, we cut a lot of them out. And this tree that I'm pointing to right now is a Norway maple. And in cutting it out, uh, we noticed that it had verticillium wilt. Uh, it had the brown and black streaking through the, the cambium and through the, the wood. And so this is actually one of the better education sites that I've found as an agent in talking about pathogens and, and selection. And, and many of you know that with verticillium, it can stay in the soil for up, upwards of 20 years. And the only solution is to plant species that are resistant. And so you can bring a, a group of arborists or a group of students here and, and show them the site, show them the species that are doing well there now. We have hawthorns, honey locusts, and some conifers that are resistant to the verticillium. 
and so it becomes a, a really great approach in, in teaching about pathology and some of the problems associated with some maples. Um, it was a it was a big undertaking. It's been six years coming, but one of the first things to that we took on was to create a permanent irrigation system. And so you can see the trenches here. We put in 14 different irrigation valves, and uh, we planted a lot of the newer varieties according to their water use. So the arboretum, the idea with the botanical center is to educate people on the wise use of our natural resources, including water. Um, that doesn't mean that everything on site is, is native or water-wise. A lot of these trees are exotic, but they're grouped together in a, in a format where the water can be isolated to, that, to those species. So they're grouped according to their water use. Um, we have a very low water use zone where we do have native plants and they receive between a half and one inch of irrigation every two weeks throughout the growing season. Um, the next section, and, and I should mention that once those natives are planted and, and watered for the first season, then we back off completely and we don't water those. Uh, the, we have a low water use, which consists of um, water-wise type plants that are non-native and they require between one and one and a half inches of water every two weeks during the growing season. And then we have the moderate water users that are um, a lot of exotics, but that still are very, um, very adaptable to our growing situations. And we give those between one and a half and two inches of water every two weeks during the growing season. And so it becomes another story that we can tell people with water use and tree species and how each one can thrive in their own situation and we just as stewards need to give that to them. Um, here's some more pictures of the irrigation process. Uh, you can see that a lot of the newer tree species that we do plant we, we give them as, as best opportunity to grow as, as we possibly can in the fall we'll come in and, and wrap the trunks with the white reflective wrap. Um, we'll hand water them for the first year and we're giving them between five and ten gallons of water per week, once a week, and then allowing that soil to dry out. And we're trying to mimic a lot of what landscapers or, or homeowners would typically do. So this is kind of a, a before shot, and then here's after, and and it's you can see it's five years into it. The trees and, and shrubs are starting to grow really nicely and get some size to them. It's been interesting to watch a lot of these species bounce back after a a drought period of two years and how well they're doing once we've uh, established a water system. Uh, another thing to note, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the ground cover that we've left around the trees is a is a path chip, and we allow very few weeds to come up, uh, and that helps to retain a lot of the soil moisture and does very well. In 2009, we were able to dedicate the arboretum, calling it the the William Varga Arboretum after the director who had the foresight to move the 70 initial trees and shrubs and who had a very influential um, input into how how the gardens would continue to grow in the future. And many of you know Bill and I can't tell you any personal stories because this is being recorded but email me later and I can tell you some fun ones. Um, another spin-off project that kind of came with the Arboretum is we needed a pathway that people could walk through and and grass as many of you know is a really great ground cover but we didn't want Kentucky bluegrass that would run and cause a lot of problems with the rhizomes so one of the local nurseries uh, and the uh, 
the Pest and Lawn Care Association wanted to evaluate a new turf type tall fescue and so we were able to get the seed and, and put that down and we've really enjoyed it. It's a lot more drought tolerant than, than the bluegrasses and it stays fairly contained in where you put it. It does have some slight rhizomatous effect but not enough to cause us issues so we've been really impressed with it and again it's another another way that we bring the industry on site to to get them some more education. We're always expanding. Um, every year we add more and more species and this is a, a plug to all of you that if you have some tree species that you want to evaluate or want to look at I would be the contact person. I'm more than happy to be the first person along the Wasatch Front to kill something. Um, and there's been a few species that I have killed. Um, we won't talk much about those today, but there's also been some that I've put in expecting to kill that have surprised me. So I will give you my contact uh, information at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to uh, give me any input on species that you want to look at. Um, it's it, like I say, the, the nurseries in the Davis County area have been excited about the project and have donated quite a few for me to look at and so I'm, I'm happy to do that for anyone that wants to become involved with the project. Here's just an example of this last year, the expansion that we did. Um, you can see eight or ten new species. We're always putting new ones in. Um, and, and we've got a lot of area to, to expand into. We have nearly 90, 98 acres and the Arboretum at this point encompasses about four. So you can imagine there's a lot more work to do. <clears throat> now I want to shift gears for a little bit and tell you kind of the reasoning behind the tree evaluation program that we started. Uh, I've, I've already told you about the background of the gardens uh, in 1998 when 70 of the original trees and shrubs were moved from Farmington. But in 2009, uh, a group of colleagues and myself went up to Oregon to do some uh, reconnaissance on some of the botanical gardens up there and some of the local nurseries where we get a lot of our plant material along the Wasatch Front from. Um, in doing that we ran across the J. Frank Schmidt Company they have a great arboretum in Boring, Oregon. If you've if you've never been, that's I think a, a a journey that would be well worth your time. But they uh, we 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 met with the growers and we met with the the group up there and had a loose agreement that they would donate between 15 and 25 of their newer species uh, to the gardens so that we could evaluate them along the Wasatch Front. Um, before we before this time, we went along, around to the different nurseries <clears throat> in the area and looked at their availability lists. We looked at what we had in the arboretum and noticed that there was a huge discrepancy on what was available currently versus what had been moved from Farmington. So we beefed up and gave the arboretum a, an update on tree species through 2008 and 2009 from what was available through the nursery industry and that continues to this day. We'll go through and, and select new new species and new varieties that, that we find in the garden centers so that we can grow them on and the public can see them in, in the ground. But uh, we've also been getting newer varieties that donated from the Schmidt Company since that time and right now I think we're up to about 63 of those types of selections. Um, they come in, in in April, March or April in bare root and so here's a picture, we bring them in, we make sure the roots stay moist and then we pot them up and we'll grow them in the container that season. We'll utilize our pot and pot tree production facility for that and then that next fall we'll go out and design where they go and put them in the ground. So one thing I want to point out is it's not just the Botanical Center in Kaysville that gets a set of these trees. We get five sets of these of each species and so uh, in 
cooperation with the University of Idaho and other entities, we're able to select different sites to evaluate these trees. Uh, the Varga Arboretum in Kaysville is kind of our control group. We have really great soil, uh, neutral pH, and the zone is, is fairly um, indicative of the, of the Wasatch Front. We have the Ogden Botanical Gardens along the Ogden River Parkway. Also fairly decent soil. Uh, one thing that we're evaluating there is water. They have a really high water table due to the close proximity to the Ogden River. And so we look at, at those type of conditions. Logan Campus, I was working with uh, Ben Harris in supplying some of the, the species up to Logan where they were planted on the campus to evaluate for cold hardiness. And I know this Ben's online, so if he wanted to give a little update on any of them, you could ask him. Um, we also go down to St. George area to evaluate for heat tolerance. Uh, along the Santa Clara River, there's a park that a lot of these species have been planted in, and Rick Heffelbauer down there was informing me that sometimes they irrigate with some salty water and so salt tolerance has also come into the mix. The fifth site is uh, the Aberdeen Experiment Station uh, through the University of Idaho. Steve Love up there is, is taking some of these trees and putting them up there and planting them. As you can see their pH is 8.3, 8.5 in some instances which is really harsh, um, very alkali and basic in their soils and they're also very cold. Um, the interesting thing is as we go back to these locations and take a look at the species that we've planted there are some rising stars coming out of the out of the trials but they've also killed a lot of trees so it's interesting to note what some of those were and we will go through some of those. Um, uh, this is the tree list that I was referencing earlier with the water use and how much water we give these plants and how we separate them. This is in, in great uh, part thanks to Mike Coons and his input. This is uh, actually out of date and so we've taken it off the website as for now. But as soon as we update with the 30 plus species that we've planted, it will go back live onto the Utah State University Botanical Center website, which you can just find by Googling Utah State University Botanical Center. And that will be up again this spring. <clears throat> so that being said, uh, I know it's a lot of history, but I wanted to give a little background of why we, we did the project and, and kind of some of the, the results that we're finding and some of my favorites thus far. Now, not all of them are going to be new species to you. Some of them will be um, some old hat varieties or selections, but they, I think, are underutilized and often uh, we could use them more in, in landscape situations. The first one I want to focus on is a State Street Maple. It's Acer myabii. It's a selection from the Morton Arboretum, and it is touted to be a hardier selection than uh, the hedge maple, Acer Campestra. And it has much of the same corrugated bark look, uh, small leaf like the, the hedge maple, but it is extremely um, cold hardy and drought tolerant. Uh, the Wisconsin Nursery Association uh, named it as the plant of the year in 2011. So that's one that I think would would add to your uh, dossier of, of plants to offer. One thing to note is I have a colleague up in Malad, Idaho that planted one of these and he has killed a lot of trees in the past but this is one that's performing exceptionally well for him. Sensation Box Elder, this again, this is not a very new one, it's, it was introduced from the Schmidt Company in 1993 um, I was still in high school, but one of the more underutilized trees, in my opinion, along the Wasatch Front. It's very hardy. As you all know, Acer Nagundo is native to Utah, and this is a, a male clone. So a lot of the 
negative press that the box elder get locally is the box elder bugs that are associated with the seeds uh, that are produced by the trees typically. But this is a male seedless clone. Um, has a brilliant fall color. Uh, the hot orange and reds. This is uh, actually one of our neighbors at the Botanical Center and I've been watching this tree uh, for many years and been very impressed with it. The one drawback that I have noticed is much like other maples you can get verticillium wilt problems and and this tree is no exception to any other maple. The striped maple, uh, Acer pensylvanicum, this is again native to the northeast in the US uh, so it's exotic around here. This is one that I received from a local nursery to, to evaluate at the Arboretum and it's been planted since 2008. Uh, I, should, I should have told you that a couple slides ago but the parentheses and the date are when they were planted at the Arboretum. And so this has been in the ground for a few years and it's put on some, some nice growth every year. It's wintered through. It's cold hardy um, it's uh, in the more moderate water use area with some of the other maples. Um, but I have noticed in, 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 the na in its natural habitat, the striped bark maple is, uh, it, lights a, it likes a very moist soil and it's more of an understory tree. And I have noticed in the Arboretum that you can get some scorch associated with it if it's a really hot summer. Some summers it doesn't scorch, others it does. And so that's one thing to consider. Um, it's, it's not really high on my list of excitement, but it's a, it's a new species to me and I've been impressed with it actually surviving. I, this is one that I expected it to die the first year, but it has very uh, unique striped bark and, and a goose foot uh, type leaf. So it's unique and it's it's one that some of the nurseries are starting to, to carry. Tatarian maples are some of my favorites. This one's called Rugged Charm. It's an introduction from J.F. Schmidt Company. They have another one that's newer called Hot Wings. It's a little bit more rounded in its shape. Um, they're very very hardy trees down to zone 3 as you can see. They're a smaller maple. Um, they have a really nice fall color. But the thing that I like most about the Tatarian maples are the Samaras, or the seeds that are, have a bright pink or often red tinge color in the summertime. It's a nice season effect. Um, one thing I've noticed with the Tatarian maple in production side of things is the first couple of years until they get some roots established, they become really they, they want to be lanky and they'll throw off a lot of really weird growth but once you can do some structural pruning and early in its life and it establishes a little bit of girth on the caliper of the trunk then it becomes a really really nice tree. Pacific Sunset Maple um, I'm going to take a little tangent. Uh, any of you that know me know I have a love-hate relationship with the Autumn Blaze Maple Autumn Blaze is a hybrid between a red and a silver maple, both of which struggle in our high pH soils oftentimes, and so the, the, the love part of the Autumn Blaze maple is the spectacular fall colors that it can present, but the hate part is the iron chlorosis that it sometimes struggles with. And I've noticed that it has a lot to do with the, the, the soil textures and the well-drained bench areas. I've seen them look really nice, but as new construction and new development happens closer towards the lake beds and heavier clay-laden soils, they struggle a lot with the iron deficiencies. Um, this one, the Pacific Sunset Maple and its sister introduction, the Norwegian Sunset, have some parentage that are a little bit more readily adapted to our area. The truncatum and the platinoides are, they do better in our soils, um, but yet you still get the nice fall coloration that you would from an autumn blaze maple. Um, the one thing I have noticed is they color up a little bit late. And so some seasons when we have an early frost, 
they'll they'll color up just before a flowering pair would and so sometimes you won't see the the fall effect um, again it was introduced back in the 90s but it's one that's gaining popularity as a, as a smaller uh, mid-sized maple Theodar cedars um, this one again it's not new but it's it's a story that has come out of the Arboretum in my mind as a very good success story uh, as you can see is planted over 30 years ago and has gone through many as well it's gone through the move for one but it's also go, gone through some really harsh winters um, and Michael Durr in his Woody Plants Encyclopedia says that this is a less coldly a less cold hardy uh, species than the Lebanon, Lebanon cedar of Lebanon and the blue atlas cedar and he even gives it a, a zone of seven in his book but I would take issue with that and say that this Theodar cedar is a lot more cold hardy than he gives it credit for and it's done very well at the Arboretum um, it did get a little bit of burn on the leaf tips as it didn't get water for the two years so it is definitely a moderate water user but as far as cold hardiness goes I think it's it's one that we that has a little credence um, along the Wasatch this next one I'm kind of excited about I just planted it last year came out in 2011 it's the Prairie Sentinel Hackberry it's a true columnar form of one of the toughest trees on earth uh, it's it's introduced from western Kansas so very dry uh, conditions it's a very durable tree can handle winds um, so you can imagine in, in, a, in a street setting this would be a very good candidate for a street tree as long as there's no power lines associated with that um, the only th I've introduced this tree a couple times in in some presentations and one question that comes up is is it does it still get nipple gall and the answer is I don't know it's it's new enough that my guess is it is it will but again it's something to consider in the future to evaluate Chinese fringe tree this is one that I had no uh, experience with in the past uh, in going through the plant catalogs many of which are back east or again Pacific Northwest you see a lot of plants that are cold hardy rated for our area but then you have no idea whether the soil becomes an issue with our alkalinity so this is one I brought in half expecting it to die uh, it's native to eastern China it's a very dark glossy green foliage and the bark is much like uh, a paperbark maple or a cherry uh, a hybrid between the two it has a nice exfoliating bark um, and these showy clusters of white flowers it has performed very well at the at the Caseville site it's put on growth in terms of feet instead of inches and it's it's become one of my favorites to be around and to prune and and to watch it as it as, as, as it establishes so the, again the Chinese fringe trees one I think would be worth looking at <clears throat> excuse me Hawthorns in our area, uh, many tend to struggle um, with fire blight, the bacteria disease that goes in through the blossoms and kills a, a lot of the branches. So hawthorns uh, tend to get a bad rap just from being ugly. Um, another thing that I've noticed with hawthorns is they lean a lot, and so <clears throat> this is one that I would recommend staking but this crusader or thornless cockspur hawthorn is one of my favorite trees in the arboretum it has a very dark glossy leaf um, almost as dark as a holly and the berries that come on in the fall resemble a holly and so it's it's very very attractive in the fall time um, and the fact that it's thornless makes it uh, even better so this is another one that I, I appreciate in the Arboretum again it's not very new to the industry but it's one that I think has some merit 
coffee trees. Uh, the Kentucky coffee trees are, are very durable, uh, Midwestern uh, in origin. The, the thing I like most about them in educating people is the bipinnate compound leaf. The, the twice compound makes it a very unique leaf structure. Um, they'll grow just about anywhere, very heat and drought tolerant. They don't like to be very wet, but I've got one in the Arboretum, this, this new uh, selection back in 1993 called Espresso is a seedless uh, variety or cultivar and it has, has performed very well and I, I really enjoy looking at the unique leaf structure. And I notice <clears throat> a lot of parks are starting to plant more Kentucky coffee trees and I think it's a, it's a great tree to, for large areas. Seven Suns Flower. This is an introduction from Plant Select out of Colorado State. Uh, it's, it's considered water-wise. Um, a lot of people would consider this a large tree or a multi-stem small tree. Uh, I've got one in the Arboretum that has been there since 2010. It's got some really great growth on it. Nice exfoliating bark. The thing I like most about it is the fall flowers that come on these um, clusters and then this pink fruit. I read some literature that touted this as being the crepe myrtle for our area. It's it's kind of a pretty plant, so that's one that, that I've enjoyed. I know Red Butte Garden has a really nice specimen up in their gardens. Osage Orange, this one is White Shield. It's introduced in 2010 out of Oklahoma by Steve Beebrich is a plantsman in the local area there. Um, <clears throat> this anyone that's ever dealt with Osage orange, uh, it's a very unique species. It has a lot of thorns usually, as the species does, and then it has a fruit that's uh, very unique. I remember the first time I saw it, I thought it it reminded me of a brain. It just has very ribbed fruit about the size of a golf ball. Um, the other thing, okay, Meredith says it gets bigger. So, anyway, uh, another side note is that Osage Orange is one of the first trees that Lewis and Clark described up their Missouri trek in, in 1804, 1805. And they, in their journals, note that the local Indian tribes, or the local natives, would travel for days to collect the wood because it is so hard and they would make their bows and, and weaponry out of them. So it's kind of a fun fact. But White Shield is a thornless, seedless variety and in the Arboretum I've had it there two years. Just as in any of the newer trees, the first year they just produce the root system, they don't grow much. But last year I measured five to six feet growth on this tree so it's very very adaptable to our area. Crab apples. Um, anyone that knows me at all knows that I'm a big fan of the crab apples and especially the persistent fruited varieties. Uh, this last weekend I was watching the birds pluck the, the fruit off my prairie fire at home. Uh, this one, Royal Raindrops. It's one of its parents is the uh, Golden Raindrop, so it has that nice cut leaf effect, but it has purple foliage and has a hot pink flower, much like the prairie fire, but is touted as being less dense in the canopy as prairie fire. And I know that from personal experience, my prairie fire does get quite dense. And so this is a, another crab apple in the mix. This is one that I hesitated putting on just because I don't have that long of experience with it. Um, I put it on because I've started noticing the box stores promoting this species, the black tupelo. And so I brought in the Red Rage, a J.F. Schmidt uh, introduction, just to evaluate it. I planted it in 2011 and it survived and it colored up uh, this last year in 2012 just fine. So. It's one that I'm going to watch in the future. It typically does like moist soils and, and acidic pH. Um, 
time. I've, let, I've read a lot of literature that states that anything above 7, it will not um, tolerate. So this is one that I'm not putting out to you, per se, as this is a great tree, but it's just one that I'm, I'm evaluating at this time. Lace bark pine. This is this is one that's been in the industry for a while, but it's harder to find. But if you can find it, it is an amazing plant. Has the exfoliating bark, really nice winter interest. The 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 needles are tufted and very sparse. This is one that really took it on the chin through through the two years of no irrigation. But as I've put some water to it, I've noticed it bounce back really quickly and so this is an, an evergreen that's got some really nice bark interest there's a lot of work in oaks and I've noticed that they are almost as numerous as the maples and the different species uh, we're all familiar with the bur oak and the swamp white oak that do well in our area this is one that I think in time could be added it's touted as being very alkali tolerant. Um, has a really nice fall color, unlike the tannin brown that most oaks get. Um, this one I've planted in the arboretum. It's another one that a nursery wanted me to evaluate, and it has performed outstandingly. Uh, it's grown really well. I have noticed its its uh, tendency to grow multiple liters or grow in, in a funky manner. So training it while it's young is is crucial but it is it's put on some really great growth and and that fall color is no exaggeration that's how how bright red it gets um, I will note that in Aberdeen at the Aberdeen station in Idaho they killed theirs and I think some of that had to do with the alkalinity up there so I'm not sure of what the range is that it would grow but it's doing great in Kaysville Giant weeping sequoia. I just throw this one in because it's fun. I, it's it's a real conversation starter at the arboretum. I call it the snuffleupagus tree. Just the way it it weeps and it's formed. Um, when we talk about backyard gardening and quarter acre lots, the giant sequoia obviously is not a good fit. But this is one that could be, and it's very unique. There's it's, there's no in-between ground on, on this tree. You either like it or you don't. I've I've heard some really interesting comments on both sides of the story. Um, <clears throat> I have noticed that in the winter, in 2010, when we had a really dry winter, uh, I did see some winter desiccation, so I went out and watered it. But it bounced back and is doing great. Japanese umbrella pine. This is... Uh, Again, not new, but it's very unique in the industry. I have a hard time finding it, but it's been in the in the arboretum or in Farmington for nearly 30 years, so it's very cold hardy, uh, very adaptable. The needles are soft and flat and in whirls. It's a very unique evergreen. Um, it does burn on the south side with some summer scorch and winter desiccation, so it it can um, grow better in some filtered shade, but it's another one to consider. The lace bark elms, these have been um, used quite extensively in the east to replace the American elms from the Dutch elms disease. They are resistant to that particular disease and they do have a nice exfoliating bark. Um, in 2005 there was a national elm study that had 18 different sites and 14 different varieties and cultivars of the new elm hybrids that are being released and I read the literature on it and noticed that the lace bark elms had a, a tendency to die the first year of establishment if they weren't particularly taken care of well and I noticed that also at the arboretum I don't know if that's a coincidence but once they're established they become a really great um, asset to the to a, an, a larger tree canopy. This emerald sunshine elm is one that came out of those trials. It's a J. Frank Schmidt introduction. Um, it's a seed selection from China, touted for its heat tolerance. But one of the things that came out of the trials was that it was elm leaf beetle feeding resistant. 
Um, I have this one planted in the Arboretum right next to a Frontier Elm, which is another selection from Schmidt that goes a bronze uh, red fall color. This last year I had a lot of uh, elm leaf beetle damage on that one and this Emerald Sunshine Elm was virtually untouched and so that's a kind of a nice side spin on, on this introduction. And it's a smaller elm. It'll only get around 30-35 feet. And so a little bit better for the urban canopies. Zelkova, <clears throat> again some of my favorite plants uh, or trees. This one is wireless obviously for the indication that it won't get into the power lines. It's about 25 by 35 so more flat topped and wide in its shape. City Sprite is a newer selection. It's a little bit more rounded and then there's Musashino that is a columnar form and in the Arboretum I have a Musashino Zelkova planted right next to a flowering calorie pear just to show that people do have a choice when it comes to plants. Um, some other species that I'm keeping my eye on, these are some that <clears throat> I either have planted or plan on planting this next year. You can kind of look through the list. Uh, Abies pensapo is one that I've seen in the Murray Arboretum that I really like. Uh, Cornus moss. Uh, Hardy rubber tree is one that I've got planted, Amurmachia, Sourwood, American Hop Hornbeam, and go down the list. But these are just some that I'm I'm looking at, and again, I would be more than happy to get you your input. This is my contact information, just jd.gunnell at u dot at usu.edu. And send me any species that you would like to consider, or any time that you want to have a group or educational uh, enrollment up at the Botanical Center, give me a call um, and we'll make it happen. Uh, other than that, that's all I have prepared. Um, if anyone has some questions, I'd be happy to answer those. All right, thanks JD, that was a great presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions that were asked during your presentation. Uh, Hal wants to know if you have any thoughts about using Roundup in the drip line area and on fine tree roots. Using Roundup up in the along the drip area? Yep, that's right. Okay, that's actually how we keep the the weeds down in the arboretum is through the glyphosate products. Um, as long as you're following the label instruction it's inactive as soon as it hits the soil, so it's one of the safer chemicals that we can use. I do not personally put it near the trunk or any surface roots just because it can um, cause issues as, as soon as it hits. It's a non-selective herbicide, so as soon as you hit tissue, it, it can be translocated. Okay, we have another question here from Phyllis who asks, was the great loss of Colorado spruce at the golf course due to shallow watering? Um, I don't think so. I, I think in general, and anyone else can chime in if I'm speaking falsehoods, but in general Colorado blue spruce are shallow rooted species. And so they're not going to be deep rooted regardless of where they're planted and so it's just a, a species problem more than a watering I believe. Ben Harris asks, um, have you heard of hardiness issues with lace bark elm in cold areas? I have not heard of any specific. Um, I, I'll pose the question back to him, is he? Uh, he says in this question he's seen what appears to be cold damage to the lace bark elm in Logan. It's very possible. Um, it's a, again, it's one that I think has merit along the Wasatch Front, but I'd, I'd be willing to. I, I would not surprise me. Let me put it that way. 
Okay, Ron asks you to list your top ten trees for wildlife, birds, pollinators, etc. Maybe we'll take a couple selections instead of ten. Okay. <laughs> um, crab apples, service berry. Uh, those those come off the top of my head. Th those are some of my favorite for the the fruit, obviously, for the feeding, but. Also, some of the dwarf evergreens just for nesting sites. Great. And we'll do maybe two more questions. Uh, one question, have you seen any iron chlorosis problems for the State Street maple? I have not. Um, again, it's only been in a few years, but I haven't seen any iron chlorosis problems with it. Here's our last question. This is from Brian Hadley. In planting the trees, are you altering the roots at all? Well, when the trees come in, they're bare root, so I can manipulate those roots. Uh, I do some root pruning, take any J roots off that I see, or any crossing or uh, girdling roots. But that's one of the benefits of these trees coming in bare root, is I can manipulate the roots before I put them in the container. And then some of the more aggressive species, if they have started doing the circling in a 15-gallon con 15 container, then I'll shear those roots, excuse me, those fibrous roots as I plant them. All right, well, that about does it for questions. Thanks again for your presentation, J.D.